Thanks to NV Play's Data Insights for helping me with this video. They can help any cricket team improve their skills using their advanced technology. Hello and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to episode 71 of the Footmarks podcast. I'm Behram Kazi, who you can find at Def Mango on Twitter. And with me, as always, is Jared Kimber, who you can find literally everywhere. And the title of this particular episode of the Footmarks podcast is How New Zealand Won a Test in India. And of course, we're going to get into the meat of that or the bones of that, Jared. Before we get there, though, just want to talk about how crazy international cricket has been recently. Go all the way back to the T20 World Cup. Uh, the New York surface, USA qualifying for the next round, Bangladesh sweeping Pakistan and Pakistan. Then you've got New Zealand now winning the T20 World Cup, the Women's T20 World Cup. Pakistan ending their streak versus England after conceding 823. And finally, New Zealand winning in Bengaluru. It's basically cricket on crack. Yeah, it's so ridiculous, the whole thing. every <laughs> Everything. I, I watched a game the other day on the way into a test match when India were playing, sorry, when Nepal were playing the USA. and. Um, Nepal were like 20 to 1 or something at one stage, right? And they needed to defend seven runs off the last over. Hmm. And Andreas Us was out there. Uh, yeah. And they still defended it. And they got a super over and then won the game. It's just like, what? Can, can, I just, you cannot watch normal cricket at the moment. It doesn't exist. No, no, absolutely not. And I mean, we've had the anti-Big 3 week as well, right? Where none of those teams, India, England or Australia, made it to the Women's T20 World Cup final. Uh, and then, of course, England lost. Now, India lost at home. We don't really get this much, do we? No, it's, it's a whole <laughs> new different feeling, isn't it? It's something, it's something very weird. Yeah, yeah, very, very unique. And now, coming on to the topic, of course, uh, for those of you who don't know, the last time New Zealand won a test in India was all the way back in uh, November 1988. And the only player, as Jared pointed out in his video, who was alive back then was Ajaz Patel. Now, in 36 years since, Jared, New Zealand have had so many good teams, right? You had the McCullum mm -hmm. team, you had the team that toured them last time. And they didn't manage to win a test. But this team, which is in transition and development, has gone on and done just that with Kane Williamson injured. And I find that very remarkable. Yeah, and some of that has to be the weird confluence of events that allowed them to win this test match. I think mm. there are some other teams who maybe would have come over who might have been able to win if they'd had a similar kind of surface and a similar kind of toss go their way, right? Like, yeah. when it comes down to it, you have to be, you have to be honest, but... That has never happened in New Zealand before, and that's why they consistently come over to draw, usually, and then <laughs> sometimes lose. They did manage a draw in that last tour, uh, but we always, whenever we discuss teams touring a certain country, and especially when it, that country is India, we mentioned how, at least in the last footmarks and the other video that you did, that you need fast spinners, you need uh, yeah. flat deck bowlers, you need minimal left-handers, you need some all-rounders. Apart from the left-handers thing, I think New Zealand... Oh, actually, fast spinners as well. I don't know if Ajaz Patel completely qualifies. Well, Retro Mavinger is probably a fast spinner, but he mm. didn't bowl that much. And what, I mean, this was not a surface that you needed fast spinners, to be fair. That's also fair. But, you know, uh, generally, when you're about to tour India, you think that you need a good spin bowling trio or duo at the very least. And New Zealand just haven't been that team throughout history. Look, their spin bowling numbers haven't been flattering historically. And even their numbers aren't particularly impressive in Asia or India even, where you expect them to be better, right? And, you know, if you look at these two teams playing in India in the past, India have mm. outspun New Zealand. And, and that too by a significant margin. So... There's also that whole scenario where you don't have a lot of spinners playing in New Zealand or bowling a lot of overs in New Zealand. So if you look at all of that, the Black Caps weren't particularly set up well to win a test in India. But then, of course, Bengaluru had different ideas. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I think traditionally they are not set up to play well in India. And this particular time it went in a direction that none of us could have guessed. Hmm. No, no, absolutely. And and same on about the batters in New Zealand. They don't get to face a lot of spin, right? Um, and even though this team, I would say, has some good players of spin. Tom Latham is good. Uh, Williamson is out, but he's generally a good player of spin. Rajan Conway. Ravindra, Conway. These guys showed us how, you know, they can really take down spin. But just on New Zealand's development as a cricketing country, you know, it's not like they are set up well to play spin either. This might be an, an, an anomaly situation where they've got some good players. But, you know, they are a team which primarily plays on surfaces or... You know, their players primarily play on surfaces back home where seamers are assisted and they don't get to develop yeah. their spin game as much. And yet here we are where Rachin Ravindra and Devin Conway absolutely attack the hell out of India spinners. 
Yeah, I, I think if you look traditionally, they haven't had as many good batters against Spain mm. as some of the other major nations, right? Mm. Um, this particular team is slightly better set up, but one of those is a South African, mm. right? Learned yes. all of his cricket in South Africa and went over as a fully fledged adult. Yes. Um, but but I, I do think, you know, um, this, this is, they've probably had this level of play of spin before, but they've probably never had a team that would have gone over with a bunch of, they probably never had a team with like, I don't know, Hussey, Hayden and Clark in it. Right. Mm. Um, you know, or some of the great West Indian sides that had like Sobers and, and Calatron and, and Weeks and Walcott and that, those sorts of players. Right. They've had individual players who can play spin quite good, but not a lot of great players of spin. Like who's the greatest player of spin in New Zealand's history, would you say? Kane, and he has a terrible record in India. So, <laughs> you know, most of the other countries in the world have better players of spin than, than New Zealand, and they don't bowl much of it, and they don't face much of it. So it makes sense. I, I don't know. I wonder if, if you went through all the first-class grounds, I reckon there are more wickets in England and South Africa in first-class cricket that spin than there are in New Zealand. Our, New Zealand might be the most monoculture when it comes to just a lack of spin being bowled. And it's not that spin doesn't take wickets there. Mm. It's that there's no reason ever not to bowl seam. Seam is just so much better. It's a very similar thing to South Africa, but the difference in South Africa is sometimes in South Africa the pitches crack and get yeah. dry, especially up on the high belt. You don't even get that in New Zealand, right? Honestly, this Bengaluru track was so similar to New Zealand surfaces and playing conditions because you've got a low first innings total, which is often the case in New Zealand when the ball is yeah. swinging and seaming around and the pitch gradually gets better to bat on. So this was like home ground advantage for New Zealand, right? <laughs> exactly. I gr couldn't agree more. <laughs> yeah. And also, you know, one big reason why New Zealand are generally at a disadvantage when they're touring India is it's a combination of things. Uh, one is that New Zealand have never had you know, world-class spinners. Uh, Vittori comes to mind, right? Uh, John Bracewell helped them win a test match back in 1988. But that's not what they're known for. And India, on the other hand, are known for both producing uh, world-class spinners and exceptional batters who play spin really, really well. So this was basically, you know, um, prior to the tour, it was kind of a show shot result. You'd think India 3-0 mm. because of all of these reasons. But... How much of it, this win in Bengaluru, would you say is down to the conditions? Because we can't really take anything away from New Zealand either, can we? Uh, I don't think you have to take anything away from them hmm. to tell people why they won. Does yeah. that make sense? So that that's does. what fans think. Like if I, there's a bunch of fans on the Cricket 8 page, right, who think I am anti Jaiswal because I keep saying, <laughs> I hope he doesn't make tons of runs at the moment because I don't want him, I don't want it to get to a point where it starts to affect him. I want him to just, mature as a batter so that when he hits his peak years he's already a solid player and then he can become the great player that we all hope he will become and they're like oh you don't want him to make any runs you hate him it's like that's not no <laughs> idiot right and it's the same here it's we it's our job to analyze the cricket the bowling average in this test match for seamers was 21 yep and the bowling average of spinners was 52 or something like that right mm. That is not a normal thing in India. Even wickets that help seamers in India usually give some assistance to spin. This one yes. didn't. It went completely the other way. On top of that, New Zealand got the absolute best of the conditions on mm. day one to bowl with. And they maximized them by having a really good bowling lineup that, that, that you know, did all the three different things that you mm. needed on that surface to be successful. So yep. things went their way. I don't think that means that it was terrible, but it was not a normal game in India. Um, and we know that because if we look at the traditional thing in India, seamers don't bowl average 30 less than spinners in a, on a normal game in India. Yeah, it's just very, very unusual. And this was probably one of the most unlike Indian surfaces that I've at least uh, witnessed in mm -hmm. India. But here's my question to you now. Of course, we can all agree that New Zealand had the favorable conditions uh, whilst they were both bowling and batting. And they executed their skills to perfection and maximized those conditions. But based on all of the analysis that you've done and I've read, is it fair to say that it had to take a Bengaluru-esque track post-rain to eliminate that natural disadvantage that New Zealand have when they're playing in India? Yeah, because I don't think... So So let's go back to the spinners you talked about before. So let's mm. talk about Bracewell, Vittori, you can put, 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 uh, Headley Howarth would be another one. They've had world-quality spinners 
they've probably never had like the best spinner in the world or the hmm. second or third best spinner in the world. Although Bracewell probably wouldn't have been that far away yeah. um, back in the 80s because there was no one else. For um, a bit in between, there was Jeetan Patel. Yeah, who they didn't pick for about 40 games and yeah. became really good in county cricket. Do you know what I mean? But, <laughs> yeah. And they couldn't pick him because there was no reason for them never to pick two spinners in hmm. those days as well, although they probably should have picked him more when they were touring. But, but the point is that when they have a very good spinner, the only time perhaps when they've had two quality spinners at the same time would be Vittori and Jeetan Patel. Yes. Right? So even if you are trying to go to India or Sri Lanka or Bangladesh or wherever, you're going with one spinner hmm. and Will Somerville. Yes. Somerville, well, sometimes, Summerfield. Yeah, sometimes Summerville, you'll, Sum you'll load Will up the all-rounders, right? you load up the squad with Santner and Glenn Phillips. and Yeah, but those are, are not frontline spinners. The other Bracewell. If, <laughs> if you go to India, like, and you are facing, and their second best spinner is Jadeja. Yeah. <laughs> and your second best spinner is Glenn Phillips. Wow. Right? Like, what are we talking about here? Hmm. And if you look through the history of, of New Zealand cricket, that's what they've been doing. Even if they find one spinner, the second spinner just isn't very good. And so how do you win in those situations? It's really, really tough. And on top of that, the other way to win is to put pressure back by playing spin very well. Hmm. And, in, and New Zealand also doesn't play spin very well. Yep. Well, historically, they don't. But I do feel like this particular team, and even the team that do it before, has some really solid players of spin. Now, you dug Solid. Up. Solid. Yeah. And the other team has Rohit Sharma. Yes. Fair enough. Do you see what I'm saying? I so even, even if you make that point that you made, and I don't think it's mm. a bad point, right? But you've just seen them play really good on a wicket that didn't spin. So mm. we're all going, God, Conway and, and Ratchet, and look at the way they play spin at the moment. It's like, well, I'll tell you, when I see them play on a wicket that really spins, if they can yes. do that again, right? Yeah, At yeah, the moment, I've seen them play spin brilliantly on a, on a pitch where no spin is bowled well. And even when their players are decent players of spin or their batters are decent players of uh, spin, it is a mismatch because India has some of the best players versus yeah. and that, that's what I'm And, and that's, the, that's the skill deficit that a lot of these teams have. Hmm. Uh, and and it's, it's, always, it's always the same in, in Australia. You might get an Indian or a Pakistani team or a Sri Lankan team come over who has some good players of pace. They're probably not going to play pace better than Australians are going to play it, right? And yeah. this is a very similar kind of situation. Another thing that makes this uh, Bengaluru test win an anomaly is that if you look at New Zealand's two previous wins in India in test cricket, right? And you dug deep over here. Those wins came on the back of spinners and a certain Richard Hadley in 1988. But not, not that deep. I only had to look at two scorecards. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but, but what we learned about Hedley uh, Howarth, or however the hell you say his name, uh, because he mm. was the hero in 1969. And then John Bracewell, who I'm guessing might be Michael's relative one way or another, an uncle yep. or something, right? He, he was... is Michael's uncle and Doug's uncle. Yes. So he was the player of the match in the 1988 win. So both of those wins came under different conditions and those probably were like more challenging for those New Zealand teams because the conditions didn't suit them then. This, this team kind of had everything going their way. No, exactly. So uh, Hedley Howarth was, um, I think, a very decent spinner who probably bowled on a lot of wickets that didn't help him all that much. Um, brilliant mutton chop sideburns um, as well. In fact, he had... Various very good facial hair at various Ooh. times in his career. But nice. so when they took him to Asia, I think he, most of his tests might have been in 69. I'm just trying to bring it up now. Um, but in Asia over, overall, he played six games and took 28 wickets at 19 and never averaged less than 36 anywhere else. So wow. in modern cricket, Howarth would be the ideal bowler, <laughs> right, to have with someone like Vittori. Hmm. That's it would true. have been absolutely perfect. And as you said, they, uh, the other test they won, Hadley took a six for in the first innings and then Bracewell took over in the second one. Bracewell was someone who, I remember Jeremy Coney telling me this, and, and it, it's something we don't talk about all that much. Bracewell, a little bit like his nephew, hmm. learnt spin bowling as a professional. Like, you know, as a cricketer, he learnt how to bowl better and better. Like and just as he got, Yeah, like Moen. Hmm. And just as he got really good at it, his body gave away. So I think he said to Jeremy, he said, I now know what I should do as a bowler. And it was basically too late because he, he was falling apart. Um, and so, you know, those sorts of things happen. But those that's such a different lineups that we're talking about to this one, right? They went in with three seamers in this game, right? They, hmm. they, they, they really went in with um, a, a really a, a traditional New Zealand lineup um, more than anything. 
And they were switched on in the field as well. Like that was mm-hmm. a major talking point in the game, how India was sloppy on many occasions, whereas New Zealand just dropped that bu- uh, punt catch, like Blundell dropped a sitter. But other than that, I can't really remember anything because there were some splendid takes in the field. And, you know, to defeat this Indian team at home in whatever conditions, right, you need to kind of bring your A game across all three facets to, to come on top. And, and despite all of these conditions favoring them, that's the point I'm trying to make, is that New Zealand still have had to do a lot to overcome India. If you make any content, Minbo Pro is the tool for you. Take your long format content and cut it and slice it for social media. This AI inspired weapon will turn your one piece of work into so many clips. Try Minbo.pro now. Yes, I, I, and that's what I wanted to get back to at the start. They still have to play good. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's all well and good to say, oh, they took all their catches, but they took all their catches. Like, that was them doing that. That was yep. that was Conway diving and Matt Henry running in from nowhere, right? Um, Southie had to be smart. Henry, who's a better bat than Southie, decided that he was just going to be Matt Henry and slog the ball everywhere hmm. um, and missed it. And Southie batted just a little bit smarter. Ratchet Ravindra didn't have to take on Ashwin, right? Yeah. Decided to take on Ashwin because he thought, in these conditions, I don't think this guy's bowling as good as he normally does. I might never get another chance to do this. And when he faced Boomer, he blocked him. They made lots of really, really good decisions all the way through the game. They still got to a point where India got back in front, though. That's how yeah. good India is, and that's how hard this is to play against this side. How many runs do you think India would have needed in an ideal or utopian world uh, to kind of bowl New Zealand out and win this game? So we were doing this on air on TalkSport as it was mm-hmm. happening, and unfortunately, about three wickets happened during the conversation, so we couldn't get through. <laughs> but I said to Jeremy Coney, one, two, five. And he's like, I feel comfortable. Hmm. And I think it's about one, seven, five when you start to get to the point of, because you look at the way they batted early on, they, Conway essentially, Conway knew all he had to do was not get out for about 10 overs. Yeah. Um, and they were going to chase that total. Right. And that is, if you're chasing 150, 175, 200, 225, that's not how you have to bat in that situation. And, mm-hmm. at that, and at that stage, then the footmarks would have come into play as well. Whereas Ravindra, um, um, uh, only, uh, sorry, um, Ravindra, wrong, wrong, wrong one. Uh, Jadeja <laughs> only got yeah. a couple of overs to bowl on the footmarks. To be um, fair, he's also Ravindra J- Jadeja. So he is, I wrong. know, but I, di- yeah. but I didn't, I wanted to specifically <laughs> remember which one I was talking about. Um, <laughs> You know, they didn't get as much out of the footmarks as they probably would have wanted. And also, I think the other thing is they would have wanted Ashwin to bowl when there was still 130, 140 runs required rather than Mm. the way that that game went. So 125, probably not enough. 150, they would have had to have um, had a little bit more luck with Conway. Once you get to 175, I think that game would have been much more um, open. And realistically, India probably should have got that lead. Yeah. No, no. I mean, when they were 408 for three... I had my money on India, right, uh, hypothetically. But I thought India would go on and win that test match. And then that was uh, when the ball changed and Pant hit the six and then everything kind of fell apart after that. There was another collapse. And if you look at this game, Jared, there are some very distinct phases that have brought about this result. First, it's obviously New Zealand bowling uh, India out for 46, right? That's obviously what decides the game ultimately. And then you have that opening partnership, right, where New Zealand... They completely eliminate the deficit without losing a wicket. Then Mm -hmm. New Zealand are at 233 for seven in phase number three, and they score that 147-run partnership, Rachin and Saudi. And then they ultimately end up with a lead of, um, what do you call it, uh, 350. And then it's that second Indian collapse, right, after the ball change. Those four things all had to happen for New Zealand to win this. I think that was a big point that I made, which was they were were bowled out for 46, and they had a 350 lead, and it was still a dogfight. Yep. So, and, and on a pitch that suited them, um, batting and bowling, and it was still a dogfight. So I think that just tells you how good this Indian side is and what mm. they can do. Um, and also the fact that in, and New Zealand can make anything look difficult. Yeah, no, no, I, I 100% agree. Uh, and on New Zealand, of course, you know, you expect the surfaces to take some turn later on. I want to talk about them historically as a spin bowling unit. And I really want to pick your brain over here with respect to kinds of spin. So you've mentioned how overspin is good in Australia. You need side spin in Asia. You know, uh, drift in New Zealand, if I can recall correctly, right? So you'll take Vittori and Bracewell and Haworth and all of these guys. 
what was their specialty? What sort of spin were they applying to the ball and how effective could they have been, you know, in India? Well, some of them were. <laughs> um, I haven't seen a lot of Howarth bowl. So um, I, my memory um, of, of Howarth was that he spun the ball quite hard and was very accurate. So he's a left arm finger spinner. Uh -huh. um, but I think his main thing was his um, control. He just never put a ball in the wrong area. So if you look at Ajaz Patel, Ajaz Patel's best ball is fantastic, but he doesn't pitch in the right area enough True. consistently to put, put to put pressure back on. Vittori, of course, is the the height was always a big thing. You know, he's a tall yeah. left arm finger spinner with a really nice action, um, and he kept the stumps in play quite regularly and could spin it. Um, and Bracewell, I think, is another sort of maybe maybe what we would call him is a I don't know maybe a hard spinner might be the way of putting it, as in. Uh, you know, he he was someone who got a lot of revs on the ball, mm. um, but a bit more polished than uh, you know uh, uh, what his um, what his nephew is. Uh, you know, I think he I think he was probably um, someone who's his neck. I suppose the best way of putting it is, I think his best ball was very wicked takery. And uh -huh. then over time, he polished up everything else around that, so that he wasn't a bowler who struggled um, in 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 various places. Um, by the way, if you've never been to a Crick Info profile of, of a Bracewell family member, it is hilarious <laughs> to see how many people they're actually related to. The interesting thing about Bracewell as well is that a little bit maybe more like Nathan Lyon, he actually had more success outside of Asia than he did inside. I'm just trying to... I think I'm right in saying that. Yeah, I am right in saying that. Um, he never he played eight tests in Asia and never took a lot of wickets, but he was a very good bowler in New Zealand where he mm. averaged under 30. Um, and he was very good in England as well, uh, which yeah. is quite an interesting one. So I think he's probably, he probably, the person he was always compared to for me, and I've seen a bit of him bowl, but I didn't see him for hours on end or anything, but he was always compared to someone like Tim May who drifted the ball away a long way and then spun mm. it back a long way. And that played very, very well in the places where you got extra drift. Yeah. None of that matters, of course, because Bengaluru had a track that didn't require yeah. any formidable spinners. What you actually needed was Richard Hadley and Shane Bond. Yeah, basically. Uh, also, I was just thinking about this today, right? It's such an interesting parallel, this test win for New Zealand that's come after 36 years to Sri Lanka winning an ODI series in India after what was it, 20 something years, 97. Uh, 27? Ah, my math is off right now. Uh, yes, 27. Because 7,000 years. Yeah. <laughs> or 240 years in, in Shoaib Malik uh, lifetime. Um, but also, I, I was thinking like both of those teams, Sri Lanka, they had such great teams in between that toured India, right? Uh, Sangakara, Mahela, Murli, Herat, they didn't manage to win an ODI series. And then now New Zealand, you know, they're done with their golden generation. These kids were not supposed to win anything. We expect them to regress and decline and uh, not win much until the next generation kind of comes to the fore. And they've gone on and defeated India. How bizarre is that? It it is. It's so weird that um that they've managed to do it. I mean, even if you told me, I'm trying to I'm trying to like go back mentally, hmm. and say, if if I knew the pitch was going to play the way it was, what chance would I have given New Zealand? And I still think maybe twenty to twenty five percent chance. Hmm. If I knew the toss result. That would be very different. But if yeah. I didn't know the toss result, I don't think I would have sat there and gone, they're definitely going to win this game or that it's like a 50-50 chance. They're still ma they would have been massive outsiders no matter how you look at it. Yep. Um, and so, and then if you look at the game situation of, you know, when, when Safraz and, and Rishabh Pant were playing again, again, I had, well, me and the bookies had India as favourites, <laughs> right? So, yeah. You know, I, I do think there is an element there of um, there's always a chance of um, getting that kind of uh, – you don't want to get too excited by the fact that a win happened because all these different things came to make this win happen. And yes. that's kind of what we're talking about is it's it wasn't like a one-off situation. Like several things had to go right for mm -hmm. New Zealand to win this game. And they still – it got a bit sticky at times. No, no, absolutely. And you spoke of the toss, right? Of how, in hindsight, had you known what the toss result would be, you could predict it. But if you were looking at the surface and the conditions, would you know what to do after winning the toss? It, was, it seemed like a really no. good toss to lose because both captains wanted to bat. I thought it was probably more likely the ball's going to seem around for a little bit with the, mm -hmm. and maybe swing because of the overhead conditions. You lose two or three quick wickets, but then you back your batters to get in, and then it was a good 
pitched a bat on. And it was, but you had to get to the 28 over mark. <laughs> yeah. You had to get out a long way into the innings before it became a good pitch to bat on. Uh, I didn't think, I, I've said this before uh, many times, a lot of people absolutely crucifying Rohit without noticing the fact that Tom Latham said he was going to bat it as well. Mm -hmm. And I said that pretty much from the start that I thought that New Zealand were planning on batting first. Um, and so if both captains thought that they were going to bat, that means that the wicket played in a surprising way. Mm -hmm. And so the tosses end up being massively important. The other thing that is massively important is that New Zealand made five chances and dropped one, or made six chances, I think, and dropped yes. one. If they made six chances and dropped three, perhaps Ashwin or Kaora or, or Jadeja would have been in as the pitch started to get better. Hmm. And they could have started to knock a soft ball around. Maybe they get up to 250. Now New Zealand's coming in, perhaps, on the following morning against the new ball. Yeah. Right? You know, all these sorts of things. That, but people never worry about any of these things, whereas they keep me up at night, Beira. <laughs> no, I know about that very well. But, you know, if you're just like looking at history, purely history, you look at New mm -hmm. Zealand's record as a team in Asia, in the test format, and they've got a terrible win percentage. I think it's the lowest amongst all Senna nations even. And they've gone on and just, you know, batted in a way, show the conditions helped them which is an exception to the norm. This entire test was an exception to the norm. We've spoken about the two yeah. other test matches that they've won, and those don't even compare to this. This is just yeah, also exactly. Weird. Yeah. This is not how New Zealand usually win in Asia, right? Like, it's yeah. really important to note that when we're, when we're going through this, because it is not a norm. I think even, as I said before, if we knew everything about the conditions and we, you know, let's take the pitch out of Bengaluru and put it in New Zealand, I still mm -hmm. think India should have started favourite. So I still think it's a great win, regardless of all that. But we have to be honest, they did not play, they, they did not um, play in spin-friendly conditions. They did not um, play against um, India on a on a fair playing field because of what happened with the toss, you know, and yeah. that's that's test cricket. The, um, Pakistan just beat England, and I still think the biggest factor in that game was probably mm. also the toss, right? Yes. Like, sometimes this happens and there's not much you can do about it. And it's funny, when Pakistan won, I, I was doing a podcast and someone put in the comments of, Oh, that's why we shouldn't we shouldn't allow the um, uh, home teams to decide on on who on you know who bats and bowls first. It should just be the opposition get to choose. Tom Latham would have picked a bat. Yeah, <laughs> that's bad. Sometimes even when you're wrong, um, yes. you know it, it goes it goes in your favor. So um, it, yeah, it's it's really important to know just how different this is and just New Zealand. Don't bowl a lot of spin. They don't face a lot of spin. Mm. They don't bat particularly well in Asia. They don't win much in Asia. They're worse in India, like all these things. And then they come out and something was in their favor. You still have to be ready for that. Lots of teams would have, there are a lot of teams who would have just rolled over and still would have let India come back into that game and win it. Yes. No, no, absolutely. I think New Zealand's execution was on point. And they always are one of those teams which punch above their weight. And I started making the argument that they're quite heavy themselves now that they just punch people around. But this New Zealand team is not as strong, right? And look at no. what they've just gone through. Greater Noida never got like a single delivery bowled over there. Then they got swept in Sri Lanka, right? And Sri Lanka is not as strong a team as India, not by any means. And now they've gone and defeated India. Like and you cannot write this script. We we talked about this with um, myself and Dan McCarty. We're talking about the fact that in Sri Lanka, they had especially in the first test. I can't remember if the second test. Like, it was the first. But in the first test, yeah, they had two situations where they were on top of the game and they completely let Sri Lanka back into it, right? They yes. did the exact same thing against India and then fought back to win it. So you have to give them credit because they played a, a lesser team and, a, and allowed that lesser team to steamroll them. And now they're playing, you know, the world's best team at the moment, certainly in their conditions, even mm. if they're not always their conditions. It's the toughest um, challenge in all of cricket to beat India in a test in India. Till once India came back, honestly, this is how I thought, this game's over. Yeah, once, same. Once they started batting the way they were batting, I was just like, they're just going to have a lead. And mm. then Bumrah and Ashwin and Jadeja are just going to absolutely tear through them. And they didn't. And that's all credit to New Zealand. I, I, I'm more impressed with New Zealand in the second innings <laughs> and the fact that they held their nerve than I am the first innings because the first innings, there was a confluence of, of, of conditions. Yeah, no, no, no. I, I cannot disagree with that. I think that, you know, when India posted 107, I was like, even if New Zealand get there, I expect them to be like seven down by that point. And they weren't. They they batted with composure and uh, they really maximized each of those phases. I think mm -hmm. that, you know, yes, conditions favored them. We cannot uh, not talk about that. But at the same time, 
it was them who kind of executed their plan. So, so credit to New Zealand. It was a fantastic test match. And uh, long may this streak of weird and whack results continue, Jared. What's the weirdest result we've had in the last couple of months? Man, I still think Bangladesh uh, sweeping Pakistan and Pakistan is pretty damn weird. I mean, it's either that or New Zealand women winning the World Cup. I think yes. those are the two that are like, those are massively high. Um, Pakistan coming back from <laughs> the other test matches is is certainly up there as well. Um, and maybe maybe it's South Africa beating Australia in the semi final as well. Um, yes. So don't, there's discredit a couple the, there, there? don't discredit the USA. They made it to the next round of the World Cup, which was their home Gosh, tournament. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah. we can't just forget that that happened. We all got net revalkered and, and blown over by that IT genius. Uh, but yes, you guys let us know in the comments section below what you feel was the biggest upset of the year. And let us know if you disagree with any of our analysis with respect to how New Zealand were able to win a test match in India. Don't, no, I don't want to know. No? Let Bayram know <laughs> that he <laughs> well, was I'm wrong gonna, in his analysis. I'm going to get flogged in the comment section regardless. But anyway, thank <laughs> you for watching this full podcast and we'll be back with more podcasts soon enough. Of course, just a quick reminder, as always, you can go to goodareas.co and bookmark that webpage. That can prove to be your one-stop shop for all the work that we do as part of this team, whether it be written content, videos or podcasts. And that is all for today. Have a good one, guys, and goodbye.